church today? You're going to really be glad before you leave. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a great harvest banquet we had this past Tuesday. This, it was amazing. Uh, the food was amazing. The place was amazing. And I just want to thank every one of you that put your hand to the plow there because it took a lot. But I tell you, I, I believe the Lord was pleased with what we did. Uh, the testimonies of salvation, the testimony of what God has done in lives was just so darn tremendous. It was tremendous. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. My wife and I have been totally blessed this weekend. We have been hosting uh, two of our best friends for many years, uh, ministry, ministry friends, and uh, we just had a great time. We talked nonstop uh, about all the things that we have experienced, all the, the times we've had together. And uh, I had invited uh, Brother Jerry Jett to come. He's a tremendous pastor, heart, like uh, I've never seen. Uh, I met him many years ago. He'll probably talk about how we met. But anyway, uh, I watched him pastoring a, a, a church in Franklin, Louisiana. It's not a big city, but uh, the way he handled his people, the way he pastored his people was just uh, such an example to me because I was a young pastor at that time. And uh, I wasn't so nice to people. You know, I, I, I figured, hey, I got saved. I turned my life around and didn't turn back. You need to do the same thing. You know, either get in or get out, one or the other. But I've learned that I can't do that. I got I to gotta pastor people and love them and appreciate them just like he has done. And so I had invited him to come, I think, preach over a year ago. He said, I got to build a house. I'm building a house. And I said, okay, when you finish building the house, call me. And he did. So he's here today. I want us to welcome uh, Brother Jerry Jett as he comes in. Uh, Praise the Lord. I am weak. I really am. I'm strong in the spirit. But I tell you what, you know, when the Lord in the Old Testament, the Lord appeared to certain of his uh, his, his uh, leaders, they were so weak at the presence of the Lord, they just kind of fell to their knees and the, the angel had to pick them up on their feet. And right now there's been such a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And uh, my wife and I, my beautiful wife, and we just stand. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next to the Lord, uh, she is everything to me. She keeps me straight, and that, that's a that's a task. But anyway, let me just say, uh, I'm humbled to be here. Uh, I, I can look over this congregation and see your faces, and all the people that Brother Carl introduced to me too. They were beautiful people, but I could look into their eyes and I could see the love of Jesus there. <laughs> you know, the Spirit of the Lord revealed Himself. Am I on? Am I on? Am I low? Am I high? Am I wide? My belt's okay? Okay. You can hear me. Say amen. Uh, we've been knowing the Catalanatas, I think, for about 40 years. Uh, we love the whole family. You can't hardly meet one with, with, uh, and love them without meeting the other and, 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 meet, and loving them. So as we met the family... The, the children, the nephews, the uh, in-laws, and all this, we have we have learned to fall in love with your pastor. And uh, you are you are. Every time I tell Brother Carl that he's doing a great job, he says, "It's not me, it's not me." Well, that's a that's a, a, a really a shepherd and a servant's heart. But God is pouring into His vessel, and Brother Carl and Sister Dawn are pouring out of their vessels and receive the receive the fruit uh, that God has given you. So we love you. The first time I met Brother Carl, we had just moved from Mississippi back to Louisiana, and I had left I had left a good position in another denomination that I could not endure anymore. So we came back home, and I associated with the denomination that Brother Carl uh, was a minister uh, licensed by, and uh, we went to the, our first uh, 
a state convention as, a, as such. And uh, I was all excited to see some of the people that I had known as a child. I hardly knew anybody but some of those older people. And uh, we found our place waiting for the thing to go. And we were right in the middle of a business session. And they had, they had, they had brought before the, the committee a resolution. And the resolution was such as this that uh, a minister would have to complete a certain amount of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, schooling and uh, a, a month of books and get credits and grades and all this kind of stuff. And there was talk back and forth, pros and cons about it. And, and we were sitting about like, if this is the front, we were sitting like over here. And way on the other side, <laughs> there was a little dark complexion guy that spoke funny. And, uh, and he stood up to his feet. And he was, let me tell you all something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, he gave them 60. When he was talking, I raised up in my seat. I said, who's that? And, and after a while, the moderator said, okay, okay, brother Catalanata, uh, uh, we understand what you're saying. And I said, Catala who? <laughs> and right then, I, I, I didn't know nothing about him, but I fell in love with him. I felt his spirit from way to the other side. And uh, I told him, we got to go meet those people. And we met them, and there's been a love affair that has been going on uh, for 40 years. And uh, it, it's a joy to be here with you. It's my pleasure. And I just appreciate you. We, uh, we got home. I, I, I don't know if we met Mia first or we just learned about Mia. But there was what they call the PK retreat. Don't start my time yet. I'm visiting, okay? <laughs> I'll let you out by two. Anyway, I didn't know if we had met me yet or not. We may have. But anyway, it, it was just another a few weeks, and in, uh, in the, in the district had a PK, they call it, the Preacher's Kids Retreat, just for the Preacher's Kids that have so much in common. So I told my daughter, Christy, I said, now listen, now when you get over there, you look for a little girl. She's the daughter of our best friends that we have recently met, and we love them so, damn, so much, and her name is Mia, Mia Catalanata. Okay, Daddy, we well, Soon as she soon as began, I said, now don't forget to look for Mia. So as fate would have it, when they got to the camp and they assigned every kid to their dormitory, they signed Mia and, and, uh, and Christy to the same dormitory. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the dorm parent, I guess she would call them, she got all the kids together. And with the lesson, she began calling their names out to make sure that they were all there. And she got to this, she said, and my daughter cried out, Catalanata! And Mia said, how do you know my name? And Chrissy said, I'm Christy Jen! And they, ah! and they became best, best friends. And this has been just the, the, the sweetest, the sweetest union. So, uh, with that in my visitation, I got we got all kinds of stories. I told somebody, listen, after spending two days with Carl, my ears hurt. The only thing that hurts more than my ears is his ears. <laughs> there was like nonstop just just talking and and uh, uh, restoring our, our our close friendship and union. So uh, thank you f uh, for allowing us to come for the invitation. We've been looking forward to that. And uh, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. And you are a sweet, sweet, beautiful congregation. Let me tell you this. Uh, my wife thinks I think I'm a know-it-all, but I, I don't. I'm not a know-it-all. Uh, I know only what I have studied for. I love the Word of God. I come to you very humbly as, as one of your fellow workers, one of your, your, one of your family, a brother, a brother to you. So this, pre this sermon, and Brother Carl can speak for this when he preaches, we're preaching to ourselves as, we, as, willing, as, as we are preaching to one another. So when I tell you what God can do for you, I'm talking about what he can do for me. When I tell you what, how you need to improve, I'm thinking, boy, that's good preaching. I need to obey my preaching. So tonight, anything, this morning, anything that I will share with you, I'm going to share from the Word of God as an observation that through the years of ministry and experience that I have, I have learned from the Lord. And God, through the Holy Spirit, is the best teacher. Right. He's the best teacher. Amen. And 
and you've only learned a lot. Uh, you've already learned a lot, and I just pray that I'll be a blessing to you today. I got to pray right now. Okay. Father, I'm here. I empty my soul, my heart to you. I clean my my mind for for from from any suppositions of who I am, but I cling to the cross and I hold to the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm desiring, Lord, that you would speak through me. For in myself, I have nothing to say. I could, Lord, I, I know I, I've got a training. I could speak for two hours here. But if you're not in it, it will be just words on a piece of paper. So I pray if there's a need this morning represented, if there's a precious man or woman that's here that, that you've been dealing with their hearts and they haven't totally surrendered to you, I pray that this will be the moment that they come to you, Lord, and just open their hearts wide and surrender completely into you, Lord. If there are those who are burdened down with maybe some problem or some care of life, oh, Father, give them strength, Lord, uh, in this meeting today, Lord, to, to keep on keeping on loving and serving you, Lord. So we seek you, Lord, and pray the anointing as you have anointed your word, even so anoint your word to my heart and use me for your glory, I ask in Jesus' name. I have a, the title, and the reason I have a title, it's, my title is not really a title, it's a subject. The subject that I'm speaking uh, to you this morning on is who is your father and what is his name? And let me explain uh, as we get into the word. I will get into some thick and maybe heavy stuff, but only for a moment. You don't want to leave this place without learning something. Do I hear an amen? You don't want to leave this place without learning something. So if you've heard something for the first time, which you may not, but some of you will, don't say, oh, what is all that? You say, well, let me see if that's true, and I'll get my Bible, and, and I'll look this up. So I hope, so I, I remember a question was asked of the ministers, how much of your sermon is teaching, and how much of your sermon is preaching? Somebody said, What's the difference between teaching and preaching? And the answer was, teaching is teaching is telling it, and preaching is yelling it. But I, I thought about that. Well, there's a mixture in my sermon. I hope I don't just preach things, you know, and get all excited, which I want to get excited, but I hope we can look into the Word and get from that, that Word something that will keep us tomorrow. Something will keep us on our road of life. And we listen, we will equip our arsenal, the battles of the stronghold. Listen, the devil's got the stronghold. Listen, we've got the high tower. We're looking down on him. We're pouring stones and firing all down on his head. He's trying to get to us. We're just trying to beat him off. So we've got the upper hand. We really do. So in, in my messages, is half preaching and half teaching. We rejoice over what we've, we learned and what we've been taught. We rejoice in it and, and we give glory to God. And listen, and listen, and we enjoy it. I wouldn't have an experience with God that I didn't enjoy. Some Christians look like they have the molly grubs. I'm using my time. It's not, I haven't even started yet. I'm still visiting. Oh, you don't have a clock. Good. My wife has a clock. Stop it. My text, my subject, who is your father and what is his name? We're going to get into some thick things, but only for a little while. When we get where it's, it's thick and deep, just kind of stay with me, okay, and bring it home with you. And check it out. It's true. Our text, I'm using... I, I've used different manners of translation, but today I want to use the King James Version because I like the text the way it states it. I'm, I'm not just a King James Version man. I'm not just, I just want to I, I look at them all, see if I can get from the Lord. So in Exodus, the third chapter, 
verses 13 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. Put yourself in Moses' place. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? I don't want to get up and say, He didn't even know God's name. What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I, emphatically, I am. I am that I am. And he, God said, he said, Thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am, I am, remember that, has sent me unto you. And for just a special introduction, let me, let me share these observations with you. This morning, I want to speak to us on the subject of our relationship with God. After many years of ministry, I've made these observations in working and ministering with people. Number one, a truly born again, what we call saved person, will live a life separated from a world of sin. His language and his conversation is going to be different. His interests, his interests, instead of hanging out at the pool hall, you want to hold, hang out at the church hall. His interests will be different and it will become different. Secondly, I've observed that far too often, without criticism, far too often, the confession of a person away from God will be, I really love God, when in fact, all they really like is the idea of them loving God. Because if you love God, you're going to serve God. If you just have an idea, I like to, you usually say, I like to be like that guy over there, but I'm not like that guy over there. I'm like this guy here. Come on. Nobody loves God like I love God, not more than I do. Thirdly, a re but a relationship with our Lord will be evidenced by a sweetest love for an obedience to God's word. And, and his will, and a pursuit of pleasing the one that we call our Father. Let me stop just a moment. I got to pick up. This is not a rabbit trail. I just want to pick up a little. Listen, I see these little babies. I'm, my little babies, Carl, family man, boy, them Catalanadas cover the earth in this area. <laughs> but I, I, I see the little babies, and I see how Dawn and Carl. They love their little grandbabies. They love their babies. There's nothing like their babies. Listen, listen, if that baby, if that baby makes a mistake, Grandpa Carl is not going to kick that baby out the house. Are you following me? So we worry too much about losing out with God. Let's just keep on keeping on and realizing that God loves us more than we could even possibly love our own sweet babies. And that's got to be a lot. That's got to be a lot. He, he loves us. He cares about us. He wants, he's always near us. He's always watching over us when we fall. He's right there. Listen, he's right there to pick us up and let, go back on again. Oh, listen, how do you love this one? When we, mis when we make a mistake, bow, bow, bow. But don't you do that again. And listen, you got a good little baby. They'll go, eh. And before they walk up, Grandpa picks them back up. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Let's don't do it again. I'm doing this because I love you. How many, how many have ever had a spanking from the Lord? <laughs> okay, the rest of you who don't know how to tell the truth, go ahead and raise your hand. Hello, hello. I was a football player. Knocked the ball down. Hey, let's go on. Okay. Fourthly, a truly born again believer will know Jesus, the Savior. And God our Father in a very personal way. I talked about it. In an intimate way. In a non-threatening way. Uh, a Savior and a Lord. And not as some strange superior being who is difficult to speak to. But a joy to speak for, through. And lastly on this little observation list. Number five. Listen. Uh, if you are not there yet. All these things I've said, if you're not there yet, do not give up. 
keep on going because there's gold in them thar hills. I'm telling you what, God is there for you. Don't give up on him. He hasn't give up on, given up on you, and he's going to bring you in no matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing. Your loving father is wanting to bring you into a tremendously wonderful relationship with him, and he will not give up on you. So, my friends, this morning I humbly and caringly ask, Who's your father? Is God your personal father? And what do you call him? Now, this is the kind of the stuff that you got to pay attention to. Or we'll get bogged down on it. What is God's name? Exodus 13 and 3 is the only place in the Bible where God gives us his name. Read it all. It's the only place in the Bible where God gives gives us his name and he tells us his name by Moses when Moses said you listen you remember the story the burning bush Moses was on a run from Pharaoh I won't go through all that he was on a back listen this is another message it's full of stuff listen he was on the back side of the desert running away from his heritage running away from his really reason purpose for living and he saw this burning bush. He had been there for 40 years, just kind of waiting for something to happen like a lot of people are. I'm just waiting for something to happen. And then here comes the Lord. He sees this burning bush. And he, he, he said, what, huh? Burning bush? There's lightning probably hit or something. And as he keeps looking, it doesn't burn up. Strange to him. So he said, let me go. I'm going to draw a nine. I'm going to see what this is all about. And as he gets close, listen, he, this is another subject another for another day. He sees, the, he sees that bush. It's not consumed. And as he gets close, he hears a, a voice. Now, I, I, think, I think the voice that he heard was so incredibly powerful and strong and authoritative when God said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Saints, when we come into the presence of God, oh, look, listen, I just thought of this. We come like this. And we leave like this. Are you there? Are you there? When God speaks to us, it's such an awesome way. But Moses, Moses knew nothing about God. And Moses said, Lord, uh, what's all this about? I'm saying this. Said, what's all this about? And the Lord said, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I want you to set my people free. And he said, what? Them people are going to kill me. They don't recognize me anymore. It's been 40 years ago. And I don't even know, you. What, what, who, who am I going to tell them your name is? And God told man, gave mankind his, his word. You go tell them that I am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you some more. Just hold on now. I got some good stuff coming in just a little while. You go tell them I am that I am. And then he told him again. Well, let me just read it right here. He told him again in the 14th verse, the Hebrew language, I am. I am that I am. Listen, in this Hebrew language, the I am is spelled W-H, excuse me, Y-H-W-H, using all consonants and no vowels. We couldn't even pronounce it. We couldn't even listen. No vowels. And it's known as the tetragrammaton. It's not important that you remember that, but that's what they call the spelling, that Hebrew spelling of God's name, the tetrathomagon, uh, and pronounced Yahweh, from which we later derived Jehovah. And I'll tell you how we got there. Jehovah, now listen, Jehovah, okay, Jehovah literally means I am the self-existing one. Put those, that English language together. God said, tell them that I am. I am that we call Jehovah, uh, literally Yahweh. He is saying, I am the self-existent one. I exist by my own power. I am. And you go tell Pharaoh that. Isn't that cool? After six centuries of Judaism, the word Yahweh, you laughing at me or with me? (laughs) 
It's okay. I told myself, listen, I'm preaching at my best friend's church. I can't be like myself. I've got to be serious. And I am serious. Did God invent laughter? At the right time and the right place. Okay, the self-existent one. I exist by my own power. Now, Yahweh, after six centuries of Judaism, the name, the use of the name Yahweh was replaced with the more common uh, uh, interpretation or transliteration that we call and we know, know, know of as Jehovah and even Elohim, whether it's the Greek uh, Jehovah. Jehovah is, he, is Hebrew and Kairos actually is Greek. But it replaced, it replaced Yahweh for these two reasons. The, the, the God of the Hebrews was becoming so universally popular. And the name of God was too sacred to be commonly used. Everybody was using Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. It reminds me of one of the commandments. Remember the name of the Lord and keep his name holy. Keep his name holy, okay? So the name of God uh, was too sacred to be commonly used. So in the third to the, through the sixth century, the early Jewish fathers began using the, the, the name, which means the same transliterated into Jehovah. Now, lastly, on this path, in the 18th through the 19th century, Bible scholars began using again the original name Yahweh. The sacred name of God, Yahweh. I remember I was in a class in a, in a class room in, in school, and they was telling us about the name of God. And they said that that the, the Jews, if they would go to a board and they'd write the name Yahweh, they couldn't take that board down. What are you gonna throw God's name in the in the trash? You know, if they had a book, they had to keep that book, couldn't destroy that book, because Yahweh's name. So they didn't want Yahweh to be so common. So they, 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 they gram grammatically used the word which meant the same as Yahweh, Jehovah. And today, matter of fact, Carl, I guess you remember, I, I, I didn't know what Yahweh was till I was in my ministry. No one used Yahweh. But through the, uh, through the 18th and the 19th century, it started surfacing up, up again. Yahweh, and we call God's name Yahweh, is the sacred name of God, Yahweh, which goes back to, I'm the one. I'm the one and the only, and I exist by my own power. Amen. Give the Lord, would you please help this preacher out? There's, if you look, if you look in uh, the uh, the book of Psalms, the 68th chapter and the fourth verse, the Bible says, "Sing unto God, sing praises unto His name, extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name, Yah." A short uh, of, of 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 the Yahweh. I read, I read that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, that great leader of peace, that through peaceful, uh, peaceful means, set Israel free from the harsh uh, um, uh, English rule. And he, uh, he, he knew about Christ and these things, and he said this. He said, you know, he said, I would be a Christian today if it wasn't that those Christians don't practice what they believe. And I can't believe what they say. But I also have read that, that, uh, that Gahatma, uh, 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 Gandhi uh, when he was dying on his deathbed, he raised up and he said, Yah! And what this speaks to my heart is here is a man that had an earnest heart and honest, and through peaceful means he spread peace to set his people free. That's what Jesus did. Not that he's Jesus, but that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, if, if my people loved this world, they would fight. In one place he said, if I wanted to, I could call all these legions of, of angels. They'd come set me free. But I, I have a kingdom of peace. And today he still has a, a kingdom of peace. Just like the, we're still on this, just like the ancient Hebrews, Aramaic, as with most other languages, a name is often an interpretation of who 
and what a person is. We see this in the scriptures repeated over and over again. On this earth today, we see that also. Let me find out where I'm at before I get lost. In the Old Testament, the many times the word of God was used in the original Hebrew text, it was not his name. It was a descriptive word used for his name. You there? You lost yet? Are you still following me? Listen, for example, the qualities of who he is and what he does for us and what he did then, he is still doing today. He was the I am back then. He, is the, he still is the I am today, and he still is God, Jehovah, sacred name, Yahweh, your father, our father, our, our savior that came, that loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son. An example of this, for example, and, and, and you know all this, our God is still the, the God, the great God I am. The Bible was used when Abraham, you remember the story of you preachers, and you, when Abraham, 100 years old, his wife was 90 years old, had no children, had no hope of having the children. The, the word came to Abraham, to Sarah, you're going to have a child. Sarah laughed. Abraham, a child. I'm 100 years old. What are you talking about? But God gave him a child. Listen. When he got the child, can you imagine? Oh, Sarah, youth came back to mind. Boy, she was nursing that baby. Oh, that's a, that's a sweet and proud Abraham. Oh, yeah. Proud Abraham. But listen, when he was a young man, God said, okay. And he had no children. He had, he had no children. He said, the promised seed is going to come through Sarah. And they devised that plan. We're not going to go in that sermon for another day. But, but there was Abraham. God said, now I want you to go show me how faithful you are. That's why we call him Abraham the faithful. Listen, take that child. You take him to yonder mountain and you sacrifice him a blood offering unto me. Now somewhere in the mixture and the confusion and all this, Abraham, one, knew that God was going to deliver him. Or, number two, he was going to follow God no matter what. When they got to the mountain, took young Isaac up to the mountain, went, the servants were behind, and, and, uh, and, and, and Isaac said, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire. So, but, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh will provide himself a sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh means it's a description of God, not his name. He is faithful to provide. We have a God that provides. And on and on. I'm going to go through these. Listen, Jehovah Shalom. You who have been saved, you have come from a life of sin when your life was misery and you, you had everything you needed, but you had no peace. When you found Christ, you, you found peace. You found Jehovah Shalom, that word used for God. Jehovah Shalom. Uh, remember when the, uh, oh, I, I, I'll just go through it in, in, in shortness. Remember, listen, Jehovah Shammah, I'm the God that's near you. When you feel all alone, the description of God, not his name, but description of God is that he's Jehovah Shammah. He's the God that's always near you. He's Jehovah Nissi. He's my banner. He's a God that's more than enough. I love this here. Jehovah Sit Canoe. I like that word. Jehovah Sit Canoe. And what that means, listen, listen. I, I, I'm sure you must feel like this because we're all God's children and we all realize how wonderful the Lord is, how great he is. And we come to him, we come to him, we come to him humbly. And uh, I, I have never felt worthy. Never. I've tried to. But I've never felt worthy because I could never feel worthy. You know, because he's done so much for me, as you mentioned. He, he, he brought us up from so much. You know, now Jehovah's Sit Canoe, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter and 21st verse, it says, For we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God, Jehovah, Sit Canoe. 
Jesus said, there's none righteous, no not righteous. Solomon wrote, there's none, no not righteous. And I tell you what, I've tried for a long time to be righteous. Just about the time I get it made, I go ahead and mess up. And I realize, listen, I love Jesus. He loves me. His blood has covered my sins. And listen, he done a finished work on the cross. There's nothing more to be done. It's all done. Just keep loving him. Come on. And he'll take care of us. And it goes on. Jehovah Rapha, Reha, excuse me, David, the Lord is my shepherd. Descriptive of who God is, the Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts, his armies, 1 Samuel 1 and 3. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. I'll tell you some more about that. But El Elyon, he's God most high. Most high, that's description of God. Elohim, translated from Yahweh, indicating the plurality of the Godhead, meaning he's my master and he's my judge. And Adonai, which means Lord. We use all the time. God is Lord. Description of who he is. He's the I am that is also my Lord. He's also my shepherd. He's also my comforter. He's also my peace. He's also my provider. He's also my healer. Every, listen, listen. There's nothing that you need that God cannot provide for us. Nothing you need. I don't care what you're going through. Listen, you, you know what you need to do? Listen, this is Jerry's therapy, okay? Look, when you're going through a bad time, project your mind. Project your mind to uh, two or three days because this, that too shall pass. Because God hasn't forgotten you. He's still faithful. He's still through, true, and he's going to bring you through that. So if you got to grit your teeth, what you, what's better to do is just the most difficult thing Ann and I have ever had to go through is where we lost our 29-year-old son to leukemia. And all this, oh, the horrors and misery of it all. When he died, we was in his room. He had a sheet covering up to him. He was a handsome boy. He was an ordained minister. He played the piano, played the guitar, played the drum, played just talented. He was what was on our staff. And we held hands we, around his bed. And I told the Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? What did I do to deserve this? You're killing me. This is the worst thing. Oh, I said, we were broken. We were broken and crushed. And I said, I don't agree with what you're doing. I don't, re I don't understand. None of this makes sense to me. But I'm going to trust you anyway. And somehow, you know, you're going to bring us through this. And I knew in my mind, I told the Lord, listen, he's in better shape now than we are. He, hey, somebody started that. He's in better shape than we are. Listen, he's made it there. He's not hurting. We're the ones hurting. And God can help us with that hurt. Listen, two things will heal a broken heart like that. One is the presence of the Lord, and the other one is time. Just hang in there. Hang in there. It'll come to, it'll, that too will come to pass. Jesus will give you uh, strength each step of the way, and you'll find that place back on the mountaintop. Listen, there would be no mountaintops if there were no valleys. But the valleys are not a place to live. The valleys are a place to visit. You're just passing through the valley to get to the mountaintop. Because he still is. He was, he is the, I am, he is the sacred Yahweh, and he still is. He, I am God, and I change not. Amen, amen, and amen. I ask us, is our name before God descriptive of who we are? Is your name before God if all these names that I've given us is just a description of God, is how is your name before God? Is your name, listen, do you have a good name with God today? Is your name before God called faithful? Is that the name God knows you by? Is your name committed? Is your name kind? Is your name loving? Is your name, surely, is your name saved? 
born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. How does God know you descriptively by your name? Do you have a good name before our Father? I, I want to share, Google this, Google this. In the late 1800s, there was an Irish family that migrated to the United States and settled in Chicago area. They were Irish. And in those days, if you know your history, the Irish were looked down upon. They were treated horribly. Nobody wanted them. They couldn't find work. It was, it was a terrible thing. The man's name was Edward. And he was a hard worker. He, he worked very hard uh, uh, taking care of his family. And Edward had a young son whose name was also Eddie. And Eddie, though he was poor, he worked his way through high school. He worked his way through college. And he had a, a, a dream that he wanted to be an attorney. As poor as he was and as expensive as an education to be a, a lawyer would be, he kept working and finally he reached his goal as an attorney. And he became very, very successful. He entertained himself by going to these dog races. You know, the greyhounds, which were spread all over the place. And going to these dog races, he came into a man in a relationship with a man by the name of Al Capone. And Edward became great friends with Al Capone. Finally, they came where Al Capone wanted to hire him on his staff, though he was a racketeer, a murderer, and all this kind of stuff. Al Capone hired him, and Al Capone called Edward, called him Easy Eddie. And he, he saved Al Capone bacon many, many times, kept him out of jail. He was, he was great and superior at his job, and Al Capone gave him a lucrative salary. He owned a city block in the middle of Chicago with brick walls around it, a mansion on the inside, Easy Eddie. Easy Eddie had all the clothes, all the sport cars, everything, everything he could ever want. But there's one thing that Easy Eddie loved more in all the world, and that was his little boy, his little boy that he named after him. He named him, named him Edward. So Edward grew up and had all the niceties, niceties of life, you know, when, when, when uh, Edward's son, Edward, got into high school, he began dreaming about himself. He wanted to become a naval pilot. To become a naval pilot, he had to attend the Annapolis, the Naval Academy. To attend the Naval Academy, you had to have congressional recommendation. Eddie knew that'll never happen because my name, is not good enough to see this man, my son, into Annapolis. So he had an idea. I'm going to go to Congress, and I'm going to I'm going to provide states' evidence to convict Al Capone. And I know that when I do this to get my son into the Naval Academy, it'll mean my life because they will not let me live. And he did that. The Congress agreed. He testified. Al Capone went to jail. He spent the last several years in Alcatraz. If you remember your history, he was there. Listen, it wasn't long till, till Easy Eddie on the dark street in Chicago was attacked by the mob. Machine gun bullets riddled his car, and inside of his car was the blood-soaked body, lifeless body of Easy Eddie. Easy Eddie, who had no good name to give, gave his life to give life a good name to his son. Well, almost finished. He, uh, young Edward, he, he, he became, he got his dream. He was a, he was a, uh, a, a fighter plane pilot. He was stationed aboard the aircraft carrier Lexington. They were fighting in the South Pacific in the World War II theater. Word came by radar through the Lexington that there's a squadron of bombers coming your way. So the commandant of the aircraft carrier sent a squadron out to face him, to warn them off, to shoot them down, to save the, the aircraft carrier Lexington. 
Along the way, Radar picked up another, an another group of bombers coming. There were nine of them, nine bombers that were closer, and they were coming also. While while their jet plane, their plane rather, was fighting one group, another group was coming. So they told, they gave uh, command for for uh, Edward and his wing pilot to turn around and try to ward these bombers off. Nine of them. So he, he, he intercepted them, and he would drive his plane through them and then turn around because he was flying a fighter plane, shooting da 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 till he ran out of ammunition. Listen, after he, and after he ran out of ammunition, uh, ammunition, he would take his plane and he would drive through trying to click their wings. To, and finally, he was joined by some more American fighters, and together they drove off the enemy. Edward limped back with his plane all shot up and himself all battered and bruised and he was given he limped landed back in the whole in the uh the uh the, the fleet the, the uh, aircraft carrier was saved and all men on board because of what edward had done in sacrificing his life potentially and so they gave him credit for saving all the men and saving the uh, aircraft carrier lexington he was the first man to receive the medal of honor the, the Naval Medal of Honor to, for, uh, listen, and when Chicago and the news, the news reached the mainland and they heard about that, they renamed their airport after Edward. And today we have an international airport in Chicago by the name of Command, Lieutenant Commander Edward Butch O'Hare. And that's where O'Hare got its name from a man who had not a good name, but sacrificed his life to give his son a good name. And, and that good name saved the lives of, of many, many people. That's Eddie and his son. Reminds me of another story. A father that loves us so very much that he gave his only begotten son to die on Calvary, shed his precious blood that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What is your father's name? What is your name before your father? You see, you know what? I thought after I got all this together, I thought, boy, that's a good message. Then I thought, what do you call your father? I call him daddy. We call him Abba, father. Like in the old days, they would say, Papa. But we would say, that's my dad. And the father looks down from heaven, and he looks at you, and he says, that's my kid. Don't you mess with my kid. Oh, yeah, he's done some things. But listen, listen. You don't see him like I see him. Is it true? You don't see him like I see him. He's my kid. He's precious to me. I gave the life, the blood of my son. I sacrificed the greatest thing that heaven had, shed his blood so that my kid could be my own and brought back to me in his failure. Listen, if you're here this morning and you feel your life is a failure or if your life is a failure, it doesn't have to be. The blood of Jesus was shed for you, not just me. It was shed for you too. Who's your father? And what's his name? There's a, there's a word, okay, this might be, there's a word that we don't use often. We know it. It's called idiosyncrasy. Anybody knows? <laughs> idiosyncrasy. This is, what the, this is what it means. It means a person has behavioral mannerisms. You know, like uh, some women may, may do like this all the time, you know. That's an idiosyncrasy. Uh, or the way you stand, a little idiosyncrasy. It, it tells about your the behavior of, of who you are, how you walk. You, you've seen some people that walk like this. When you got short, short legs, you walk like this. <laughs> but the way they walk, the way they stand, the way they carry themselves, that's their, their idiosyncrasies. If you still hear, say amen. A behavior, characteristic, a habit, 
our mannerisms of such that is peculiar or distinctive. Are you peculiar? The Bible says you are. Your mannerisms ought to be distinctive of a child of God. Your mannerisms are distinctive of an individual. Your look, the way, the way you smile. Remember, I told us at the beginning about, about the people I've met, beautiful people, but they got a sparkle in their eyes. That's an idiosyncrasy of the Holy Ghost. That's the Spirit of the Lord in them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an idiosyncrasy, a spiritual, I, I would call it, a spiritual idi idiosyncrasy. Example, that kid that looks just like his dad. Do I, oh, praise God. Story about Mia. I love Mia. Mia's my sweetheart. I do. We love Mia. And uh, Mia and Christy in bed, little eggs, in, in the same camp. Christy told me this. If it's not true, I, I like the way I tell it anyway. <laughs> Listen, they had planned. Look, after everybody goes to sleep, we're going to go and uh, we're going to go outside and kind of roam around the camp. You're not supposed to do that. We're going to roam around the camp. So, okay, yeah, we can do that. So after a while, and everybody's sleeping after a little while, Chrissy, she gets up, she sneaks over to over to Mia's bunk. And Mia was sleeping. And Chrissy said she looked and she said, Carl! <laughs> that kid looks like Carl! <laughs> Do you look like your dad? Do you act like Abba Father? Isn't it good? Listen, you know when you're sweet? Oh, and we pray this, Lord. Oh, Lord, touch me. I pray this all the time. Whenever I get kind of out of myself sometimes, and I realize, and I say, God, you got to give me a, a tender heart. Because like Brother Carl alluded to, I'm going to be rough and gruff sometime and think, hey, I, I got to get back to where I need to be. I need to have the idiosyncrasies of the Lord. And, and, I, and I'm just about finished here. It's just like his father. Listen, he has the same mannerisms as his father. His smile, his soft voice, his personality. He stands like his father. He walks like his father. His musical talent, like his father. His abilities, his athletic abilities, like his dad. His and mama's too. Mama's too. Listen, his his academics. He's smart and he's a, he's an outdoorsman. He's a spitting image of his dad. And I ask again, are you like your father? And who is your father? Because you're going to be like your father. Who is your father today? Born again. When we are born again, God's word tells us we are all fathers. We are all the father's children. Romans 8 and 14. Now, many as are led by the spirit. Are you led by the spirit? As many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. For you not have received the spirit of bondage. Listen, you're not going into sin. He's taking you out of sin. You, you have the spirit of God in you, so you're not, you don't return to the spirit of bondage, the spirit of fear. Listen, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we, we cry out, that's my dad, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father, you are my dad. And listen, and uh, oh, I could preach on it. Let me go ahead. I'm running. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay, when we become God's children, we leave our old fleshly lives behind. Now, may I tell you this, God will help you, but he won't do it all. God needs our participation. We make one, one look towards him, one step towards him. He's there. That's our father. He loves us. And I'm going to close right now with this thought. Write this down. Isn't it amazing? That, that doctors, that medicine, the technicians, they can take a sample of your blood and they can prove who your mother or your daddy is. They can prove who your siblings are. Uh, is that my real? A good friend of mine just went through the guy and said, he was his brother. He said, let's get blood tested. Test came back. No, you're not his brother. Because the blood, the DNA proved that, that, that he wasn't. And technicians today can tell, look, who's your father? 
who's your siblings. They can tell what, na what nationality you are. They can even tell what part of the country of that nation you came from. Some of you preachers are already ahead of me. You're getting, you know what I'm getting? Listen, God can look at us and through the Holy Spirit, he sees who we're like, who we're born to, that the blood of Jesus spiritually flows through our veins. And God says, that's my child. Who's your dad? That's my daddy. Who's his child? It's me. Deserve it? No, but I'm still his child. Come on, somebody start to clap him. I'm still his child. How does this happen? Romans 8 and 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our, with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's how we know. The Holy Spirit bears witness. We're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. That's how. Well, who he's talking about? He's talking about you. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into glorious light. Who's your father? Stand with him. Father, you know, you know, and I don't know the needs of the people here today. Somebody here may have been planning on getting their hearts right, but they haven't to this moment. And now is a good opportunity. So you're going to have to do the work because I'm not able to. So as we pray and seek your face, someone this morning